Okay, question one. Nice easy start for you. Uh, the order stop is given at time t is zero. Um, so at t is zero, you just read up here, um, and you can see that this is at 18. So we need to just give the answer 18 meters per second. Uh, it was important for that one to make sure that you gave the, uh, the correct unit. Part B, um, suggest why the car continues to travel at this speed for 0 0.9 seconds. Um, that's because um, there is always a reaction time. So the idea was that uh, at this time here, they say stop, um, but it takes some time before the foot presses the brakes. Um, you see a lot more of this on other exam boards, but it is worth knowing the difference between thinking time and stopping time. So you are then to calculate the deceleration of the car between uh, 0 0.9 seconds and 0 0.4 seconds. Now, deceleration, um, that is another word for acceleration. Obviously, it's going to be uh, negative, though. Um, so you might want to use the SUVAT equation, which is acceleration is change in speed. So we often use that as uh, V minus U over time taken. So uh, we know from previously that uh, v is uh, 18 meters per second. We know it comes to rest, so u is zero. Um, and the time taken, that's going to be the difference between it. So my acceleration is going to become 18 take away zero divided by 4.0 take away 0 0.9. Um, and when you plug that into a calculator, you should get uh, 5 point eight meters per second squared. Then ask for the total distance traveled. Now I would always say if you're doing something like this, the easiest method is to calculate this total area. So what I'm going to do to do that is I'm going to split it into two separate areas, area A and area B. So area B is a uh, B. Area B is a rectangle. Um, we know that this length here is 18, um, and we know that it takes 0 0.9 seconds there. So that's going to be 18 multiplied by 0 0.9. For B, that's a triangle. Uh, the base of this triangle is 3.1 seconds. And the height of it again is 18. So B is going to be a half multiplied by 3.1 multiplied by 18. Um, so when you put those two together, the full equation then, you're looking for the distance travelled, which I'm going to call S. Um, that is equal to 18 times 0 0.9 added together to my a half times 3.1 times 18, plug that into a calculator, and you should get 44 meters. Question C, describe and explain a danger to the, of, to the driver of not wearing a safety belt during a sudden stop. Um, so the idea is uh, in a stop or when stopping, so I'm going to say in stopping, uh, driver has momentum. Um, this keeps him moving, keeps the driver moving, and that will uh, make, make them then hit the windscreen or the steering wheel. Hitting windscreen or the wheel. And then it's always good just to spell that out really clearly because sometimes examiners think you're an idiot. So if you hit the windscreen or the wheel, that could cause injury. So I'm going to say causing injury to the driver. Question two. Got an ice hockey player moving on ice. He's prone to hit this uh, on the ice a solid disc called a puck. It's quite nice to see that they've uh, made it really clear for us with an example as well. Uh, the disc of mass 0 0.16 kilograms is moving horizontally on the surface of the ice at a speed of 15 meters per second. Calculate the magnitude. That means the size. Remember, magnitude always means size. Uh, 
of the momentum of the disk. So I'm going to use here the equation P for momentum is equal to mass multiplied by velocity. Um, so it's a nice simple one. Mass is in kilograms, which is what we want. So that's going to become 0 0.16 multiplied by the velocity. There's the velocity. That one was the mass. So 0 0.16 multiplied by 15. Um, and that should come out as 2.4. Then we need some units for that. Uh, so we've multiplied a mass by a velocity. So it's the unit of mass, which is kilograms, multiplied by meters slash seconds. Make sure you don't do kilogram slash meters per second, because that would mean kilograms divided by meters per second. And we've not done that. We've multiplied it. So it's kilogram meters per second. Part B. The hockey player strikes. And uh, just another reminder, strikes means hits. So he hits the disc with his hockey stick and the momentum of the disc changes. The disc gains momentum of 3.0 kilogram meters per second at 45 degrees to the original direction of travel of the disc as shown below. So it was moving this way and now it's gained momentum traveling that way. So they want you to first of all state the magnitude of the impulse exerted on the disc and the direction in degrees of the impulse. So if you remember impulse that is just equal to uh, change in momentum. Well, sorry, that is just change in momentum. Um, and then forces impulse divided by time. Um, so the magnitude of the impulse, um, that's going to be uh, the gain in momentum. Um, so it's gained a total momentum of that so it's the, so the change is going to be 3.0 um, some of you may have like added or subtracted that um, but remember impulse is the change in momentum so if it's saying gain it means i've added that on um, now the units um, moment impulse can have the units kilogram meters per second um, but actually Generally speaking, for impulse, we normally use the uh, units newton seconds. Now, this morning I was in a meeting where we decided that we would accept kilogram meters per second because newtons second and kilogram meters per second are actually they they mean exactly the same thing, and that's something you can do at A level. Um, but just be aware that impulse generally um, impulse is equal to force times time. Force is measured in Newton, time is measured in seconds. So really you should have Newton seconds there. Um, but don't worry too much if you got uh, kilogram meters per second, just one to remember for future. Um, and again, impulse is a vector quantity, so the vector is acting at 45 degrees. Uh, so we're going to have 45 degrees here as well. You did need both of these together to get the mark. Now, you're then asked to determine the magnitude of the new momentum of the disk and its direction relative to the original direction of travel by drawing a scale diagram. This is important because if you try to do this using maths, you might know the cosine rule or something like that, you're going to lose the marks. You have to do it the way that they tell you to do it. So obviously it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to show on a screen, but I'll do my best. Now, the cool thing about momentum being a vector quantity um, is that that means that we can then draw it as a uh, as a, uh, a set of vectors. So my first vector that I'm going to draw is my uh, initial velocity. Um, so that's going to have a uh, magnet, sorry, not, not velocity, my initial momentum. Um, so my initial momentum was 2.4. Now, it's probably worth you doing something like uh, one centimeter is equal to maybe uh, three kilogram meters per second. Um, that's probably about right. So you've got to make a scale. So if I did do one centimeter is equal to three kilogram meters per second, um, then on this one, what the examiner would be looking for um, would be uh, six, seven point. Uh, eight, I think. It's quick maths in my head, so it might be wrong. Uh, that would have to be a line that's 7.8 centimeters. Um, they would then look for a second line. 
that would also be uh, drawn to scale. So this one's going to be the momentum that we are adding. Um, and it's going to be at a 45 degree angle to what it was before. Um, so one of the things that they'll be looking for here is they're going to measure, let me just check on the original diagram to make sure it makes sense. So that's 45 degrees, so it doesn't actually matter which way around it was. Um, but this would have to be 45 degrees. So they, they, the examiner would check that. Um, usually they have a, a, a transparent sheet of plastic that they put over there to sort of look at that. Um, so they would be looking for this one to be uh, 3.0 kilogram meters per second. And again, it has to be drawn to scale. Um, so using this one, that would be 9.0 centimeters. Um, and then what they would be looking for is for you to draw a line connecting the two of them. So we've top and tailed our vectors. So that's going to be our resultant vector, um, which you would then measure with a ruler, write down your uh, length of it, um, and then convert it back into a uh, momentum. Um, so we're looking for something in the range of, let me just check the mark scheme, they would accept anything between 4.8 and 5.2 kilogram meters per second. Again, make sure you include the unit because they haven't included that. And then you're going to measure this angle here for the direction of it. Hopefully you can see just by inspection you're looking for something that's less than 45 degrees. Um, and they were looking for anything between 22 and 28 degrees. Quite a lot of things you need to do there to get the marks for that one. Okay, question three. A vertical tube contains a liquid. A metal ball is held at rest by a thread just below the surface of the liquid. Okay, so there's a diagram, and just be careful, this whole thing is full of liquid. Fine. The diameter of the tube is much greater than the diameter of the ball. Um, I think I know where they're going with this, but let's just see. The ball is released, and it accelerates downwards uniformly uh, for a short period of time. Describe what happens to the velocity of the ball in the short period of its time as it accelerates uniformly. Um, so really, it's asking you here to be able to describe... Um, what's uh, what's happening as something uh, accelerates. Um, so we are looking for it increases for one mark and at a constant rate for a second mark. In other words, uh, every uh, moment in time it's, it's added the same amount of velocity on. The ball reaches terminal velocity. Describe and explain the motion of the ball when it is from from when it is released until it reaches terminal velocity. So for this one, we want a little chain of uh, logic. So first of all, it accelerates. Uh, so velocity increases. Uh, now we might want to say this is, um, why does it accelerate? It accelerates uh, due to its weight. Yeah, so if you think about it on here, there's a force acting downwards mass times gravity. We then want the idea that uh, as it accelerates, um, the drag on it, or the uh, resistance, or the friction, whatever however you want to call it, drag increases with velocity. Because the faster you go, the more air resistance you have. So what we're doing is we're starting to add a force acting up in the opposite direction. As a result of that, our resultant force on it is decreasing. Because our resultant force has decreased, the acceleration decreases. So it carries on accelerating, so velocity is still increasing, but by not as much. So, yeah, so it's really by, but by less. Um, and then the, so the cycle repeats, the so drag increases until eventually the size of the drag is equal to the weight. 
That gives a zero resultant force to cancel each other out, and it travels at a constant speed. Okay, um, there were different things except in the mark scheme, but I think if you're making notes on this, that's probably the best answer to have, because you want to do this as in a complete way as possible. Um, and you might see the exam, sometimes it will say except three of those, sometimes it will say except four or five. So you never, you're not going to know in the real thing what in particular they're looking for that time. So it's really important that you give as much detail as you can. Part C, the metal ball has a mass of 2.1 grams. It falls a distance of 0.8 meters between being released and reaching the bottom of the tube. Calculate the gravitational potential energy transferred from the ball as it falls. So remember, EGP, uh, gravitational potential energy, is equal to mass times gravity times height. Now this mass here, they've been a little bit sneaky, so it's probably a good idea to rewrite that as 0 0.0021 kilograms, because we can't use grams in this equation. So this one becomes 0 0.0021 multiplied by 10, which is always g, um, and the 0 0.8 is in a unit that we do want, so we can do that multiplied by 0 0.8 plug that into your calculator and you should get a number that is about 17. Uh, again, it's not good enough just to give the raw number. We need a unit for this. It's an energy, so we're going to give it in joules. Part 2. When the ball reaches the bottom of the tube, it has a speed of 1.2 meters per second. Calculate the kinetic energy of the ball. So to do kinetic energy, you're just going to remember that kinetic energy is equal to a half times mass times velocity squared. If you don't know that, go make a flashcard about it and remember it. So again, plugging in those same numbers as before, that's going to be a half times 0 0.0021 multiplied by 1.2 squared. Remember, it's just the 1.2 that gets squared, and don't forget to square it, because that's something that a lot of people do as well. Um, and you're going to find a very, very small number from that. Oh, sorry, actually, I got this 17 was wrong. That was me looking at the uh, the calculation incorrectly on the mark scheme. Sorry, this should have been 0 0.017 joules. Uh, kinetic energy is going to be uh, 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 joules. Does it explain why the value calculated in C part 1 is different from the value calculated in C part 2? So the idea is the kinetic energy is less than the uh, gravitational potential energy. So we seem to have lost energy. And we know that we can't do that. So what's happened? Well, if you think about it, the this uh, 0 0.017, that's the energy that was uh, from the, the ball being at the top of this tube. So as it's got to the bottom, some energy has gone elsewhere. Where's that energy gone? Well, uh, energy is always required uh, to overcome friction. So if you remember, it's got to push past it. Um, so that energy is lost as heat from rubbing through that fluid um, and, and and enabling the ball to drop. Question four. The source of energy of solar energy is the sun. Tick the box next to the resources, which sun is also a source of energy. So very nearly everything in the universe, uh, or everything that we use, is uh, actually from solar energy. Um, so coal. Coal is actually the remains of dead plants. Um, those plants came for, uh, grew through photosynthesis from the sun. Geothermal is one of the few that is not, because geothermal was, for, uh, was is created from uh, hot rocks in the centre of the Earth that formed as the Earth formed around the same time as the sun. So it's actually not from that. Hydroelectric, on the other hand, that is caused by it, um, whether that's through uh, tidal power or through dams. Either way, it's the sun that drives wind and rain. Um, so I can also might as well go and take wind while we're at it. The sun causes wind and rain by heating up different bits of the planet and creating the water cycle. So ultimately, all that energy comes from the sun as well. Uh, nuclear, again, was actually formed in dying stars uh, from other solar systems. The sun isn't uh, heavy enough to create uh, the uranium that we use in civilian nuclear power. Um, so nuclear is also one of the few things that doesn't actually come from the sun eventually. Figure 14 point, sorry, 4.1 shows a solar water heating panel on the roof of a house. So we've got copper tubes that are painted black there on the roof. 
Cold water flows into the copper tubes, which are heated by solar radiation. Hot water flows out of the tubes and is stored in the tank. Explain why the tubes are made of copper and painted black. Um, so a couple of different interesting reasons here, um, but you've basically got two things. One is made of copper, one is painted black. So why copper? That is because copper is a good conductor of heat. Um, remember, whenever you're being asked for um, things like this, we've got to remember convection, conduction, radiation. So you've got to mention these explicitly. Why are they painted black? Well, black is a good absorber of infrared radiation. And again, you must not say it's a good absorber of heat. It's not a good absorber of heat. It's a good conductor. Sorry, it's a good absorber of infrared radiation. Same, you can't just say copper takes in heat. You've got to say it's a good conductor of heat. Okay, in 0 0.5 seconds, 0 0.019 kilos of water flows through the tubes. The temperature of the water increases from 20 to, to 72 degrees C. The specific heat capacity of water is 4,200 joules per, kel per kilogram per degree centigrade. Calculate the thermal energy gained by the water in 5 seconds. So for this one, um, we've got a big clue here from specific heat capacity, so remember that heat energy is equal to mc times the change in temperature. So we're asking to find this q, so this is 0 0.019, multiply by my specific heat capacity, which is 4200, multiply by my temperature change, so that's just going to be take one away from the other, plug that into your calculator, um, and you should get 4,100 joules. So then to say that the efficiency of a solar panel is 70%, calculate the power of solar radiation incident on the panel. That basically means what is the power in. So for this one, we need to remember that percentage efficiency, that is equal to the useful power or energy, uh, you can use either, out over the total power input, power input, multiplied by 100. So I can say 70% is equal to the useful power output, um, now, to calculate that, um, oh, they've been a bit sneaky here, haven't they? Okay, so we're being asked for a power. Okay, let's just break this down a little bit. Uh, power is work done divided by time taken. In other words, it means how many joules, how many joules in one second? So here we know that the thermal energy is uh, 4,100 4, joules, but that is in five seconds. So for this one, we're going to need to divide that by five. So that becomes 4,100 divided by five, all divided by the total in multiplied by 100. Uh, so then we just finally rearrange this equation um, and what we will find is that the total power input uh, is equal to 70 divided by 4100 over 5 um, and that comes out as uh, 1200. And this is a power, so power wants the uh, unit watts, which means one joule per second. Okay, question five. A U-shaped tube of cross-sectional area of constant cross-section area contains water at a density of a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, both sides of the U-tube are open to atmosphere. Uh, so this is a uh, type of uh, device called a manometer. Manometer. 
Most words are hard to difficult. It's difficult to stop spelling. Um, so you should remember this from your lessons. It is really important you go back and study these. You can in theory understand them from the basic stuff that we study about atmospheric uh, physics and, and uh, pressure and density. But unless you really understand manometers specifically, you do get into a bit of trouble with these. They're, they're quite tricky things. Okay, so we're told that the uh, atmospheric pressure is 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals. The left side of the tube is now connected to a gas supply using a length of rubber tubing. This causes the level in the water on the left-hand side of the tube to drop by 2 point, sorry, 0.200 meters, as shown. Calculate the pressure of the gas supply. Okay, so um, in order to do this, what we need to say is that the pressure on each side of these tubes is going to be equal. So what I can say is that the pressure on the right hand side that is going to be equal to the pressure from the air plus the pressure from the liquid. Now what I can also do is I can ignore all the liquid down here because these two bits of liquid are going to be the same pressure. So I just need to find the pressure of this liquid and I can just add it to the pressure from the air as well. Um, So that uh, so how do I find the pressure of this liquid? Um, so to remember to find the pressure of the liquid, it is the density of the liquid, which has this funny symbol rho, remember, um, times gravity times the height of the liquid. Um, so this this uh, is water, so it has a density of a thousand multiplied by ten multiplied by uh, zero point eight. I believe it said. Oh, sorry, no, it's not 0 0.8, 0 0.2, which is the height of the... Oh, sorry, it's not the height, isn't it? That's, that's half of it. Um, so I want double that. Uh, so that's another 0 0.002. So its total height will be 0 0.400. I think I just misspoke there on the uh, height as well, but it's definitely 0 0.400, isn't it? Okay, not quite sure why it's not letting me erase that. Let's just put a line through it then. Uh, 0 0.400. 0. Okay, and then I need, so that's going to come out as uh, that, and I need to add on the atmospheric pressure, uh, which I was told was 1.00 times 10 to the 5. Um, and when I plug all of that in together in my equation, um, I should come out with uh, 1.04 times 10 to the 5. And this is a, pass, this is a pressure, so pressure is always in pascals. Part B. Figure 3.3 shows the gas supply is now connected to a cylinder that contains a piston. Uh, so we've got the rubber tubing going into a gas supply, there's a piston. Uh, the pressure in the gas moves the piston to the right. The area of the piston in contact with the gas is 0.025 meters squared. Calculate the resultant force. So I have a pressure, I have an area, and I have a force. So I'm going to use the equation pressure is force divided by area. Another example of why it's really important that you learn all the equations that you need. So what we need to understand here is on this side we have uh, 1.04 times 10 to the 5 pascals of pressure. This side is open to the atmosphere, so this side is 1.00 times 10 to the 5 pascals of pressure. So what we end up with is a kind of resultant pressure, which is just 4,000 pascals. Now that tripped me up quite, uh, quite badly. Um, so just be aware of that, um, that because of that pressure difference between the two, you do have a different, uh, uh, you actually only have 4,000 as your pressure. Um, so we can then say, once we understand that, it's quite easy. Uh, pressure is force divided by area, therefore force is pressure multiplied by area. Uh, my pressure difference is 4,000 multiplied by uh, 0. Uh, 0. 
where's my area gone? There it is, uh, 0, 2, 5. So that comes out as 100 newtons of force. Before we were calculating the resultant force on a piston. So the resultant force was this uh, 4,000, uh, sorry, 100 newtons, uh, because we've got uh, this pressure difference. However, when we're finding out work done, as most of you probably know, we know that work done is equal to force multiplied by distance. Now the force is just the force in the direction of D, or the direction that it moves. So that force is actually different. That force is the force of the full pressure. So uh, the force from that pressure is 1.04 multiplied by 10 to the 5, multiplied by the area of it, um, which was 0 0.0025. Uh, yes, zero, sorry, 0 0.025, multiplied by the distance of 0 0.5. So when you plug that in together, you're going to get 1,300 joules. That was a spectacularly tricky question. Okay, question six. So here you're shown a tank of water viewed from above. The depth of water is different in the two parts of the tank. So one thing I'd like you to look at, it's, uh, it's marked on here uh, crests and troughs. Um, so presumably we can say that this will be a crest um, and this would be a trough, the dotted line. Um, so the first thing that's interesting to note is here... I'm going to call this lambda 1 for a first wavelength. And if we look here, you can see that the second wavelength is shorter. So here, the waves are traveling quite quickly. Here's they are traveling a little bit more slowly. Um, the second thing that's just worth doing is marking in the, the actual kind of path of the uh, what we draw as a ray because what you've got here are the wave fronts, but if we draw them as a ray, uh, they'd go something like this. Um, and the last thing I'm gonna do, just to make my life a little bit easier as well, is I'm gonna mark in the normal. So then you're asked to explain why the direction of wave fronts changes. So um, what I would hope that lots of you would remember is just this key fact, um, so point one, is the fact that the wave uh, changes speed as it crosses the boundary. Um, now, the next thing to talk about is, well, how does it change? So um, I always teach my class to think of a little car driving onto sand. If you imagine, well, what would make it bend downwards, so it bends towards the normal, it must be slowing down. Um, so we would say um, the wave is faster on the, uh, sorry, the left-hand side and slower on the right-hand side. Um, and then, well, okay, so why does that actually change direction? Well, the reason it changes direction is that uh, the bottom of the wave fronts, uh, or, or the wave fronts at the bottom of the page, let's say that way, yeah, um, we'll say wave fronts, uh, helps if I could spell, wave fronts at the bottom of the page, enter uh, first, well, I'll say enter the slower section first, um, causing a change in direction. So a little bit tricky there. I would say it's probably worth uh, just sort of memorizing those definitions because it is one that uh, comes up uh, occasionally in, in the exam. It's worth being familiar with it. Okay, now as we're getting a bit further into the mock, the next question gets quite tricky. So this, given the speed now of the wave in the left-hand portion of the tank is uh, 0.39 meters per second. So I'm going to call this VL for V on the left. Uh, that is 0.39. But then asked to find the frequency of the wave. Now, um, I didn't notice it originally, um, but you can just see here 
um, a zero point, uh, sorry, a, a two point six centimeters as the distance between, as I said earlier, a crest and a trough. So therefore, lambda is going to be double that. So the wavelength uh, will be five point two centimeters which is 0 0.052 meters. Remember, when we're trying to calculate a frequency, we're going to need distances in meters. So uh, for this, you should remember the equation V is equal to, mm, that's the wrong equation, V is equal to F lambda. Um, and I'm trying to find frequency. So frequency is V over lambda. Uh, so my V is 0 0.39, and I'm dividing that by 0 0.0. 5, 2. The mark scheme can be very confusing. I think I think what they're trying to do um, is just make sure that you've identified these two numbers. I think that's what they're looking for, um, that you've identified wavelength and you've identified wave speed. Um, anyway, when you do that, you will get the, uh, the final correct answer in the mark scheme, which is 7.5, and you must remember to include the unit hertz for it. You then ask to determine the wave, the speed of the wave in the right hand side of the tank. Now this is really tricky. So to do this, we're going to use two different forms of Snell's law. The first one we're going to use is the fact that refractive index is equal to the ratio of the speeds of the material. So we can call that V on the left divided by V on the right. That's one way of finding refractive index. We can also say refractive index is equal to sine of the angle of incidence divided by sine of the angle of refraction. Now, looking at it here, we've got the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction marked for us. Um, it's actually quite tricky to see which angles it is that they're marking here. Um, or, or, or what this 33 refers to. Um, so originally, I went ahead and said, well, maybe they mean that uh, this angle is 33. I think that's what they mean. Um, so you've got to do a little bit of uh, mathematical manipulation there to work out that if that's the case, actually also this angle will also be 33 degrees. Um, so just check your answer. If you got, um, what was the number I was searching for? Uh, 90 take away uh, 33. So if you use the angle 57 degrees, don't feel too bad because actually that's what I did the first time I looked at this question as well because I was got a little, just got a little bit confused about what angles they were marking. Um, easy way to remember it, of course, is that if it's uh, bending towards the normal, we would expect the angle of refraction to be smaller than the angle of incidence. So 45 and 33 do work like that, but that was also pretty tricky. Um, now these two ends are the same, so I can say the velocity on the left is over the velocity on the right is equal to sine of the angle of incidence over sine of the angle of refraction. Um, and I do know velocity on the left, so I can say uh, 0 0.39 over the velocity that I'm trying to find. That is equal to sine, uh, sorry, the angle of angle of incidence is 45 divided by sine of 33. Um, do make sure your calculator is in radians, um, and when you rearrange that, um, I'm just going to be quite lazy about it, and I'm going to say 0 0.39 over, and I'm just going to um, put it all into my calculator right at the end, so that's going to be divided by, make sure you put the brackets in, sine of 45 over sine of 33. As long as you've got the brackets, that's going to give you the right answer, which is uh, 0 0.0 three zero zero and I think you get like a two or something here. I, I did check it earlier. Um, so we can say our speed is zero point three zero meters per second. Question seven. Figure eight point three shows three lamps and a fuse connected to a power supply. The EMF, remember that's the uh, voltage of the power supply, is two hundred and twenty volts. Each lamp is labeled two twenty volts forty watts. The rating of the fuse is 2 amps. Calculate the current in each lamp. So to calculate the current, I'm going to use these facts here. I'm going to use the fact that power is equal to current times voltage. Once again, CIE, you've 
got to just memorize so many equations because CIE really, really do um, push those equations. So uh, my power is 40. That is equal to my current multiplied by my required voltage, which is 220. So my current is 40 divided by 220. Uh, which comes out as 0 0.18, and again, must have a unit, 0 0.18 amps. Part 2, calculate the current in the fuse. So there's a couple of different ways you could do this. Um, probably the easiest is to say, right, so I've now worked out that each of these will have 0 0.18 amps going through them. Oops. Um, and if we remember Kirchhoff's uh, second law, or Kirchhoff's current law, uh, the current that goes through here is going to be equal to the current through all of these parts. So the current in the fuse will be three lots of those 0 0.18 amps. Uh, so when you multiply them together, you should get uh, 0 0.54 amps. Uh, calculate the total number of lamps in parallel that could be connected without blowing the fuse. So quite an interesting uh, question. So the current in the fuse is 2.0 amps. Um, so what I want to say is that each, each uh, lamp is going to use 0 0.18 uh, amps. So I can say I can have a total of 2 amps with each one getting 0 0.18. So how many does that give me? Well, that comes to uh, 10 point, uh, sorry, uh, it doesn't, it comes to 11.1 uh, amps, sorry, 11.1 in total. Now I can't have 0 0.1 of a lamp. Um, and if I include, if I said included 12 uh, lamps, well, that would uh, give me uh, more than my uh, two amps that I can have. So my number is 11. Um, do note, if uh, when you did part one, if you did here, if you rounded to more than one decimal place, sorry, to more than, more than uh, two decimal places, I mean, um, you may get an answer of 10.9 uh, or so uh, here. So if you got 10.9 for this, uh, that will also give you the mark. The key thing we're looking for is to make sure that you, uh, you always round down when we're thinking about a number of lamps, because obviously if you round up, you're going to go over the current limit. Part B. After a very long period of use, the wire filament in one of the lamps becomes thinner. Underline how this changes the resistance. So this is just one that you have to memorize. The longer a wire is, so if we say length, if the length goes up, resistance also goes up. If the thickness goes up, resistance goes down. So we've got the opposite here, we've got the thickness going down, so that means resistance is going to go up. State and explain the effect of this change on the power in the lamp. Well, um, so there's a couple of different ways you could use this. The first one you could say is power is V squared R, sorry, V squared over R. Now, the voltage across the lamp isn't going to change because they are lamps in parallel. So each one of these lamps is going to get 220 volts. Um, so straight away, we can say that the uh, total power will uh, decrease because R is getting smaller. There's another way of uh, thinking about this. Um, we could also say power is current times voltage. Again, voltage is staying constant. Well, what about current? Well, if current, if, if resistance is increasing, that leads to current decreasing. So this number's got smaller, this number stayed the same, um, so the power again will decrease. So we need to say that the total power decreases, and then either you can say, um, because P is V squared. Oops, uh, V squared I've forgotten the keyboard shortcuts for Windows because it's been so long since I've used it um, 
well, I'll tell you what, I've, just, I've already written the equation down here, so you can just say because of either of these, um, just make sure you do say that uh, voltage is constant. It's not in the mark scheme, um, but it's worth uh, including. Question 8. State what is meant by the direction of a electric field. Again, if you look at your definitions book, this is one that you just have to know. Um, the direction of electric field is the direction of the force on a positive test charge. Um, if you remember, in general, an electric field line, uh, that is the direction of uh, the forces on all points. Um, or, on a force on a electric, oh, sorry, on a uh, positive test charge it has to be positive when dealing with electric fields. Figure nine point one shows a pair of oppositely charged horizontal metal plates with top plate positive. The electric field between the plates is uniform. So we've got this again, uh, this use of the word uniform, um, which tells us it is the same in all positions. Okay, uh, draw lines on figure one uh, to represent this field, add arrows to show the direction of the lines. Okay, so field lines always go from positive to negative. And if you remember, the distance between the field lines uh, represents their strength. So what you want to have is these field lines all being the same distance apart um, to show that they're uniform, that the strength isn't changing. They, you want them all to be straight, you want them all to be parallel, and you want them all to be pointing downwards. If you want, you can just show at the edge here, uh, the field lines will curve around, but on CIE, uh, IGC, that's not really necessary. Part B, figure 9.2 shows a very small negatively charged oil droplet in the air between a pair of oppositely charged horizontal plate. The oil drop does not move up or down. So just in terms of forces, why the oil drop does not move up and down? Right. Well, first of all, we can say um, the forces on it must be balanced. And it must be balanced because if it's not moving, um, it can't be accelerating. That means the resultant force must be zero. So let's start off by saying resultant force on the droplet is zero. Now, what are those forces? Well, there's two going on, aren't there? The first one is its weight, mass times gravity. And remember, it's negatively charged. It's going to be attracted up to this positive plate and repelled from this negative plate. Um, so I'm going to have here a force due to the electric field. Um, and what I can say is that those two must be equal. So I can then say uh, upwards force, um, which is due to electric field, and the downward force is due to gravity. And then I can say upwards force and downwards force are equal. Okay. Without losing any of its charge, the oil drop, drop begins to evaporate. State and explain what happens to the oil drop. Okay. So, um, if we think about this, so um, the oil drop is negatively charged. So, as it evaporates... Um, it's going to start to lose mass. And if you look at this uh, drawing I said here, the weight is mass times gravity, so mass is starting to get smaller. Now, this electric field strength, this only depends on the charge of the oil droplet. So the more charged it is, the more force it has. So I can say um, that uh, weight is decreasing, uh, upwards force is staying the same. So I can say, therefore, the upwards force becomes larger than the downwards force, as you can just see, because if the bottom one's getting smaller, it's going to be the case. So therefore, the drop is going to start to accelerate upwards. Um, so we'll start to see it moving upwards, and it'll get faster and faster as it goes.
An iodine isotope 13153 of iodine decays by beta emission into an isotope of xenon. Uh, state number of particles, sorry, state number of each type of particle in a neutral atom of iodine 131. Um, so protons and neutrons, that's easy. If it's neutral, they're going to be the same. The proton number is the bottom number, so that's going to be 53. Neutrons is not much more difficult. We just remember that this mass number is protons plus neutrons. So uh, the number of neutrons will be uh, 131 take away 53, which is 78. State the symbol in nuclear notation for the xenon nucleus. Okay, so this is beta minus decay. So what we need to remember in beta minus decay is that a neutron turns into a proton plus an electron, which comes out as the high-speed uh, particle. So if a neutron is turning into a proton, I would expect the mass number to stay the same. So this is going to be 1, 3, 1, um, and it is xenon, which have given us a symbol there. That's Xe. Um, and I've turned a neutron into a proton, so I'm expecting one more proton. So this should be 50. Four. Um, remember, you don't need to memorize the periodic table. So um, if you're ever thinking, oh god, I don't know, I don't know the mass number or the, the proton number of xenon, um, you're missing something from the question. There, there is inf they will always give you the information to work it out. Okay, the background, the background count rate of radi radioactivity in the laboratory is 30 counts a minute. A radioactive sample has a half-life of 50 minutes. The sample is placed a fixed distance from a detector. The detector measures an initial count rate from the sample above, including background. Remember, it says including background of 310 counts a minute. On figure 10.1, plot suitable points and draw a graph of the count rate of the sample corrected for background. Now, they've given you a bit of a hint here because you can see this doesn't actually go up to 310. So what do we need to do? We need to find the start count rate and correct for that. So the start count rate will be 310, and then we've got to take off the background. So the start count rate will be 280 counts per minute. So my first plot point here will be 0 uh, to 80. Uh, 7580, there it is. Now I'm going to try and plot this as neatly as I can on the screen, but it doesn't work brilliantly. Okay, so remember the half-life is the time it takes for the activity to half. Half-life is 50 minutes. So I'm going to go along here to 50 minutes, and at 50 minutes it should half. So at 50 minutes, let's just do it here, let's put a uh, time and then count rate here. Uh, just for my reference, so at time 0, count rate will be 280. At time 50, I'm expecting 140. So there's 50, uh, there's 150. Uh, so that's going to be there, will be 140. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and then at 100 minutes, it will be uh, 50, 60, 70. Uh, so there's 100 minutes, because remember, this is another half-life. So you just move it along one half-life. That's going to be 70. That's 75, so that should be 70. Uh, and then after uh, 150 minutes, I am expecting it to go down to 35. So 150 is here. Uh, that's 25. So that will be uh, 30, 35. Should be about there. And then we're going to join them up with a nice smooth curve, which is probably going to be quite difficult to do on the screen. Yes, it is. Um, but you draw them with a much nicer curve than that. Okay, last but not least, uh, this is a lenses question. Uh, figure 7.1 shows a converging lens and the image eye formed when an object is placed to the left of the lens. The principal focuses are labeled A and B through the center of the lens. Sorry, the principal focus is labeled A and B and the center of the lens is labeled C. 
on figure 7.1, draw two rays to locate the position of the object. Now you might get a bit confused because normally when you get when you get a question like this, they give you the object and ask you to find the image. But actually a really interesting uh, principle of uh, how light works, which is that lenses always work identically whether light's going forward through them or backwards through them. In fact, there were some theories that, uh, well, before we knew that light travelled, um, that seemed even more logical because people assumed that light wasn't actually travelling at all, so it makes sense it does the same whether it goes forwards or backwards. What I'm saying, therefore, is that you can actually just start with I and treat it as the object and work out where everything goes that way. So let's draw in the rays. Um, if you remember, there are two light rays that you need to draw for a question like this. The first one starts in the center. I've just lost my my, uh, my line. OK, it starts at the tip of your object. So your, well, in this case, your image, and it goes through the center. So what I would do with my ruler is just draw a nice long line, making sure it goes dead center through my lens. The second line I'm going to draw is a uh, line that goes through my focal point. So when you draw one through your focal point, that has a slightly different property as it travels through the lens. So there I'm drawing it through the focal point and then through and then making sure it meets the middle of my lens. The line that then leaves from there, if it's gone through the focal point, that's going to become a straight line. Oops. So it's going to look something like this. So then we are going to draw our object which meet, which is uh, formed where the lines cross. Um, and it does say draw the object and label it O. So we're going to need to include an O here to label it. Ring all the correct distances that are equal to the focal length of the lens. Um, so this, remember, it's the distance between the center of the lens and the principal focus. So this is one focal length. Um, and it's always, again, because of this uh, I did that light acts exactly the same forward and back. The focal length is always the same on both sides. So I'm looking for AC and CB. And there you have it. Just one thing to point out, you, you can do one additional line on here. Um, it's not usually necessary um, for CIE, but just for completeness, um, because I do sometimes teach it this way as well. And I want to just be as, uh, as thorough as possible. Um, I could have drawn a third line, which comes out from here straight until it meets the uh, center of that. And then we'll draw a second line, which goes through the principal focus on the other side. Um, and you'll see there again, they all meet at the same point. And that's a nice little check that you can do when you do a question like this. Um, just do the third line to make sure that you do all meet in the same place and your answer is correct.